Hi guys, welcome back to the channel Shell in Science. I'm Shell and I'm in science. And today we are kickstarting a new series on the channel where I will go around having conversations with fellow female scientists, really to share their experiences um, in science so far and give some tips and advice for you guys who are aspiring to become world leading <laughs> scientists in the future. And today we have with us Shalene. Yep. Um, and let me just hand it over for you to introduce yourself. Okay, uh, so I'm Shalene. Uh, I am currently a postdoc working uh, as part of the Stem Cell Institute and uh, Roger Barker's group at the VGB in Cambridge. Um, and yeah, I've been asked to try and give some useful tips about how it is being a female in science and how you could maybe get there. So hopefully it'll be useful, but we'll see. Cool. And I think one thing that would be interesting that I want to add on to this, if yeah. you're comfortable, would be to bring it from the aspect of being a minority okay. in science and yep. sharing, using that as a view mm -hmm. of talking about your experience and maybe okay. as that being a disadvantage or an advantage in that regard. Um, that's a tricky one, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is this stigma of, you know, if you're a female, then it's very rare that you go into certain domains and fields. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to university, it was actually quite surprising. And I have to say, I was shocked when I did my undergraduate in neuroscience at UCL mm -hmm. uh, back in 2009, that actually it was 50-50 in terms oh, of male-female ratio on our course. However, it turns out that I'm probably the only one out of my cohort who ended up sticking in academia, purely academia. Okay. Um, whereas majority of the males ended up going into either consulting mm. or f more pharmaceutical roles. Mm -hmm. um, and was I this directly after graduating? Yeah, so basically um, about half of the people ended up doing uh, PhDs. Mm -hmm and they were purely uh, academic PhDs and then a couple of people went into actual postdocs mm -hmm. and then after a year decided to give that up because it wasn't for them and a lot of people have ended up either going into uh, pharmaceutical mm. uh, like domains or they've gone down the consulting route or completely different and there's some people who've even ended up as civil servants which I actually wow. think is amazing yeah. that if you start off doing a science degree but then you can you open up it, so yeah, many doors really um, so you don't close any and in terms of going back to the minority part mm -hmm. I don't think that's ever played a role for me I've always been someone very driven and if I'm interested in something, yeah. I'll do everything that I can to get there, mm -hmm. if possible. Um, I mean, it was more difficult in the sense that having grown up in Tanzania and then coming here, it was a bit of a culture shock mm -hmm. and not quite knowing what should be expected of me in, like, in Western society. Yeah. But otherwise, it's never been something at the forefront for me. I've always taken it as... I'm interested in doing this, mm -hmm. I have this passion, I have this drive, I'm just gonna go for it. Mm. So moving off, so you said that you grew up in Tanzania, when uh -huh. did you move over here? So I was quite young, so I moved here for secondary school. Okay. Um, but having gone to an all-girls school, mm. uh, whenever we had career days, yeah. we had, our career days were always orientated around certain fields. Mm -hmm. Science was sadly never one of those that came up. Mm -hmm. and. For me, that's something I've tried to give back to my old school is to try and say that, you know, it is doable, oh, it is possible. Yes. And there's several examples yeah. of many of us throughout the years who've gone. And I think now looking back on it, more and more girls from my old school are actually looking into science careers, yeah. oh, which I think great. this is great. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Making progress. So, yeah, exactly. So it, it's definitely changing yeah. for the good, definitely. Um, but I think, yeah, we can not necessarily just as females in STEM, but even males around can yeah. try and promote and say, you know, it, it's a domain that's for everyone. It's it not is. orientated it really is. to one type of person, you know, one type of minority, mm. you know, yeah, I think it's for everyone. So, I mean, before we started recording, yeah. one thing I wanted to try and put across is that with most of the scientists that you see with their big titles and mm -hmm. experience, one thing that I really want to drive to you guys is that 
they didn't always think that that yeah. would be what they would they weren't born and were like oh yeah <laughs> in 20 years i'm gonna this be a pi yeah. i'm gonna be doing yeah. this so can you just shed a bit of light on your sort of pathway so you said you moved when you moved um here and you did your secondary yeah. school here what were the experiences what were the things you were exposed to that made you then shift on to oh i would like to do science and what were the choices that you so, made that that's actually this? a good question i don't know if i have a straight path so to speak which and is great lot, and that's <laughs> what i really want to show is there isn't a straight path um, it's that and i think there's a lot of situations where however much you think you're going to go down a specific path it's mm. what you're faced with that kind of determines where you end up and i think that's more my situation mm. uh so i always thought i'd be in the medical field mm -hmm. um i did always want to do tropical medicine Oh. Uh, that was kind of my thing that yeah. I was interested in. Um, so I thought I would go down the medical route uh -huh. in that sense. When I came to the UK, I kind of, you know, did the standard subjects at school where it was like the science and the maths. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been interested by languages and speaking for different ones. That kind of was a little thing I had on the side and I thought, oh, yeah. brilliant. I could combine languages with some science subjects and so I initially thought okay I could work for Médecins Sans Frontières and I you know do mm -hmm. things that way and then maybe have kind of a lab experience on the side because yeah. a lot of the medical degrees kind of integrated the two um, so I applied for med school mm -hmm. um, and back in during my time <laughs> it was you had one extra choice aside yes. from medicine uh, and I chose yeah, so I chose neuroscience because mm -hmm. I was always fascinated by the brain itself. Um, and I got in for neuroscience at UCL and I thought, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. Yeah. Uh, again, it was one of those things that was put in front of me and I thought, you know, it's a world leading institution, neuroscience it's number one for, mm -hmm. why not? So I did three years of undergrad. And it was actually one particular professor of mine who really ignited that passion wow. and drive in me. So Professor Christian Jessen at UCL mm -hmm. uh, gave this his introductory lecture to us. Uh, and his main focus was on Sean cells and nerve injury. And from that very lecture, that's it. I oh, knew wow. I was hooked and I kind of put med school to one side. Yeah. And uh, I ended up doing my bachelor's in his lab. Uh, and then lab my placement. Yeah, my lab yeah. placement. So I did uh, my third year project yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in his group. And I absolutely loved it. I felt this kind of passion. Yeah. And, you know, there's moments of obviously in science everywhere and everyone knows there's mm -hmm. a lot of failures. But it's that one positive result yeah. that you get that just wipes out all yes. the negatives. And I had quite a few of those. And I just thought, you know what, this is it. This is it for me. And I was lucky enough to get a position in their group as mm -hmm. a research assistant doing a PhD at the same time. Oh, lovely. So I then spent another five years mm -hmm. with them. Uh, and then from that, I thought, you know what, I've kind of got two main options, which is another thing that I think is difficult in science mm -hmm. and that we're not made aware of all the different options that we have post-PhD. Yeah. Uh, so it was either do you go down becoming a PI and you go down the purely academic route or do you branch out and try industry, industry. and then see what comes yeah. that way. So I was umming and ahhing for a very long time. Uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted. I just knew that I'm someone who's very happy at the bench, mm. uh, who loves the you know wet side of the lab. Yes. And so... I came across a position at Cambridge, which was actually half uh, industry, half academic. Mm -hmm. So it was part of the AstraZeneca postdoc program, okay. uh, which is what I'm currently on. Uh, and what I thought was brilliant about this is the fact that I could have a foot in each mm -hmm. door and I could get an experience of what it could be like being in industry yeah. slash in academia. As well as building networks as well. Exactly. Um, so that's what... That's how I've ended up yeah. where I am currently. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually glad for all the different things and all the different obstacles that got in my way, so to speak, mm -hmm. for you know now ending up where I am. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't a very clear cut route, but I think I've always had the kind of scientific mindset mm -hmm. and the interest in that side of things. Um, I'm very hands-on and I love problem solving and thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. So if it hadn't been that, I think it would have been something like engineering maybe. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's 
pretty much how I've ended up where I am. Cool. I was really resonating with a lot of your story because yeah. I can actually <laughs> share yeah, those experiences. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. Before, I think. when I was applying for uni, yeah. um, I was like, okay, it's going to be medicine, and then I didn't get into um, yeah. the the universities that I applied to. So I was like, okay, I'll go along. I did a biochemistry degree yeah. at King's College, and I was like, okay. Then my plan was I would do my yeah. degree and then I'll do a postgraduate um, mm-hmm. degree in medicine. And it was not for me. It was my second year because. Um, it was the summer between my second and my third year. Yeah. Because King's offered this summer studentship. Oh yeah. I've had and really I was then like, oh. That, yeah. And as you said, when you had that lecture with um, your professor, yeah. that ignited. That was the same for me with Dr. Claudia um, Linka. Yeah. It was at the end of the semester that yeah. she came and she showed her. She taught us about neurocrest development. But what I really liked about it was she showed data from her lab. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. And I was difference. just like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> You kind of think, oh my god, this actually, this yeah. is the type of stuff that happens. It's exactly. not just in films. Because it's, I feel like yeah. you shift from, you know, the textbook science yeah, of, oh, I this agree. is what happens to, like, seeing, this is what this lady does, yeah. real life science, being at the edge, the verge yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of knowledge. So I was like, okay, let me go in yeah. and get in on this. And that's what she was. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy how quickly it can switch. It, it really and, does. Yeah, I mean, there's some moments in life that just stick with you. It's like another thing that drove me to even consider you know, applying to certain universities mm. and for the de- courses that I yeah. wanted was my chemistry teacher because she was there and she said, if you're interested in something, mm-hmm. don't let anyone tell you that you shouldn't do it. Mm. And I think the thing that I, you know, try and do most is to never feel like I have a regret. Yeah. And if that means putting myself out there, setting myself up for failure, mm. that's fine. That is a I mean, I, I kind of like to think that, you know, it's a case of you succeed in finding out what fails and that's a success in itself. Yes. So, yes, yeah. that's that kind of what I, you know, that what is I go very, with. Thank yeah. you for that. That's <laughs> very spoke, very spoke with me. So a question I have now, something from that is when you had this ignition of your, yeah. of passion, was it then, okay, obviously, that switched off, okay, medicine. Mm. But then was that then a initiate, immediate tick of, yes, I want to do a PhD and follow this path? Not at all. Okay. Because um, I... Whoa. <laughs> I mean, I think this yeah. needs to be addressed. Like, we need to talk about this so, aspect of it. There shouldn't be this automatic kind of progression, so to speak, of if you do an undergraduate degree in science, you have to do a PhD straight away. We need to stress this. <laughs> You can get to wherever you want to be and not necessarily do the PhD straight exactly. away. I know a lot of people who, having done a science bachelor's degree, went off and did a master's in policy and regulation, mm. went and did a master's in you know forensic science, something completely different, different. marine biology, yeah. nothing to do with neuroscience <laughs> whatsoever. And then it was only from that that they kind of thought, well, you know, if I do a PhD mm. in a science, whatever it may be, yeah. I'm not closing off any doors. The only thing I would really stress is if you want to do a PhD, you have to be prepared for the absolute roller coaster ride that you're going to have mm. and just be ready for the fact that not everything will work yeah. every time. Yeah. But it you build like you it's so character building mm-hmm. and you come out a very different person to what you were when you began. Um, so I have no regrets doing it. I did mine straight away. I didn't do a master's in between, but mm-hmm. that for me was just because I was purely interested in what I was working on at the time. Yeah. And it happened by chance that there was this position being advertised and I thought, you know what, now is the time for me to just give it a shot. Yeah. I got it, but I was prepared that if I didn't get the position, I would just have to maneuver mm. and try and find a different way of getting back into it. And for that, maybe I would have considered a master's in mm. something completely different. To just give me a bit more of like an opening and yeah. let me go down whatever path necessary later on. Yeah, I think so, yeah. taking off on that is that stress of you should not, don't feel the pressure. Yeah, of there's no going to <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Um, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing to is. do. And I think you need to, everyone needs to be told that it's not something you go into lightheartedly. It's not. Um, it's not a tick box exercise mm-hmm. whatsoever. And I think sadly, I've seen this as well is that a lot of people feel that there is this pressure this expectation Mm. that you know if you've chosen to do science you have to do this and then you have to go and do a postdoc no No. that's not how it works Uh, there are many avenues that you can go down and still be involved in science somehow Mm -hmm. 
Um, so yeah, for me it was, I mean, it was, it comes across like it was an automatic mm. bachelor's PhD <laughs> and then straight into postdoc. I haven't had a break in between any of it, so it has been a conveyor belt for me. But again, I think that's more circumstantial rather than yeah. I necessarily had it in my mind that I was going to do it mm -hmm. this way. Yeah, and I think, again, if I talk about mine, is when I, in my third, no, my fourth year of yeah. uni, because I, after doing um, a placement mm -hmm. in Dr. Claudia Linker's lab, I decided to extend my degree um, to give myself more experience, to really question yeah. whether or not this That's was... That's what you wanted. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and after that, I still didn't feel just as ready to do a PhD, because I yeah. felt, because I acknowledged how much of a thing that is. It's and a big one. <laughs> it's a thing you really, really have to consciously yeah. think about and know, okay, am I someone who will be able to hack this, who will be able to deal with this? Like, I mean, I also it's, think it's good to reflect on that and think, can you hack it? But it's also one of the things, if you're open to the mm. fact that this is the situation and you might struggle, you it might not be yeah. for you, be willing to accept that that is fine mm -hmm. and that is allowed. It's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't want it to be interpreted that, you know, you if you think you want to do it and you're not completely sure that you shouldn't try yeah if the opportunity arises and you are able to give it a shot i say go in 110 percent yes but then just be prepared that it might not work out and it might not be your cup of tea it might just it doesn't suit everyone yeah um and yeah i think there's a lot of people who started at the same time as me and we all had varying degrees of success during mm -hmm. our phd time but some really thought you know it's completely put me off doing mm. anything to do with science and That's they change and they're super yeah. happy now whereas when I knew them during their PhD they were miserable about mm. it and it was just a case of well I've started this I need to finish, finish it, it which is another attitude to have and I think you do need to be slightly stubborn and mm. keep pushing but not to the detriment of yeah. you know yourself and yeah. people around you so I think it's a fine balance between knowing when to stop and exactly <laughs> when to carry on I mean I know a friend we did our um, degree together and he applied for PhDs mm -hmm. and he got through but just in the first few weeks yeah. I was like this is not a fun thing <laughs> which is yeah and it's fine it's, uh, exactly yeah. and it's fine and, and through that I think he's he's now chasing a medic career which is what uh, he probably we, wants yeah yeah so it's I think it's that notion of don't think that life is this tick box and it's, it's streamlined. Like it's you really need not. to be receptive to the opportunities that you um, experience yeah. and the options that you have and which ones you think, okay, this, I have oh, yeah, completely decide completely upon agree. that. Not but like, it has to be at this. Yeah, like, it, it, it doesn't. Does. And I think that's the difficulty is that a lot of people have a very narrow, streamlined yeah. tick box type of attitude. And for some careers, maybe it can work that mm. way because there is a very clear, you know, ladder progression, mm. step by step, you can go upwards and sideways. Yeah. I think it's more tricky in what we do to necessarily be like, oh, it's an obvious upward mm -hmm. step or side step. And yeah, if you can have the attitude of being someone who's flexible to situations and very malleable to what is around you and the opportunities that present themselves, it definitely helps mm -hmm. um so yeah cool okay <laughs> so um just to get some like factual details so mm -hmm. do you did your a level here what subjects yeah. did you do so for a level i did uh biology chemistry mm -hmm. uh, and french that's what mm -hmm. i carried on but i did five as's where i kind of had the maths and the very abstract resistant materials in there because someone was very hands-on ah. and creative so I was like oh that just you know changes it up okay but I very much focused on uh, kind of the sciences yeah. and languages like I say has always been something that I've enjoyed mm -hmm. and again I thought that could help it's never going to yeah, be a hindrance it's having never, no. the extra and I think that's actually an important thing that I would say if someone came to me at that stage saying mm -hmm. oh what should I choose for A-levels I would always say so having chemistry is never going to be a bad thing. Biology mm -hmm. is a good addition yeah. for, you know, a topic that's sciencey. Mm -hmm. But I think if you can have a third subject which is just completely, yeah, you know, not related, mm -hmm. it's never going to hinder anything that you do. Mm. Just, I think the way that the education system is here, you have to be strategic with what you pick so that you don't yeah. narrow your options from a very young yeah. age and you give yourself that breadth. Yeah. Later on. Cool. Now, one thing 
I want to try and touch on as well is the environment, the research environment, mm -hmm. and how I mean, as you've mentioned, doing like when you talk about PhD, it can be it's a character building experience. Yeah. But <laughs> I think it's there is this underlying tone, and maybe not very underlying, that research can be quite cutthroat. Oh yes. Right. It what can. has been your experience in that regard? And then also try and move on to kind of tips and establishing a good work life balance. Okay, so it's quite a loaded question. Right, that's very loaded. Let's see how good I can be. <laughs> Let's break it down a little bit. <laughs> um, so, first question was to do with how cutthroat yes, uh, research. research is. It's exceptionally cutthroat. Um, and I mean, what have I kind of. So, I'd say what I've maybe directly felt is more the sense of it's cutthroat when it comes to projects not working and going mm -hmm. the way that you anticipate so you always work from a hypothesis but your hypothesis is something that is always changing yeah. as you go along with the things that you find or you don't find so it's been cutthroat in the sense that, that i have found there have been a lot of times where i've embarked on something with mm -hmm. you know full gusto and i'm like yes this is gonna work this is it and then you slowly find that actually even with a working hypothesis mm -hmm. you're not actually getting anywhere um and then you kind of have to, within yourself, be able to say, I need to stop now yeah. and I need to cut my losses and move on. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the most difficult things which you need to learn very fast if you want to keep progressing. Mm -hmm. Because you could spend years bashing away at one particular thing That's and it turns cool. out that it's never going to work. Yeah. And you also have to bear in mind that funding is a big, big thing that yes. hangs over you. Yes. Um, it's not infinite. It'd be mm -hmm. nice if it was, uh, but it's a finite resource which you constantly have to yeah. search for and look for options as to where you can get it from. So it is exceptionally cutthroat. I just would say personally I've only felt it more when on an individual basis where I've had to be cutthroat with myself okay. and my own research mm -hmm. questions. Um, I know people who have been in a worse situation in the sense where it's, you know, a project and funding kind of just stops mm. and then that's it and they you yeah. know really need to grapple and, yeah. and find well what do I do next I've been lucky enough to not be in mm. that type of situation but it doesn't mean that on an individual basis it's not hard to kind of yeah. accept that you have to cut your losses and move on and change mm -hmm. things so yeah it's ruthless um, which I think if you're aware of the fact that you're walking into something that's quite ruthless it's a good starting yeah, point, yeah, but good. nothing will ever prepare you until you actually have to go, go through, through it. Yeah. Um, and your second question, oh, work-life balance. <laughs> How about you tell me what that's like? <laughs> um, I am not very good at that, I have to say. Mm. Um, Do you think whether... that's deteriorated the longer you've your insights because I feel like I'm still early on in my science yeah. career and I'm very conscious about maintaining this so Sometimes I think I that's good keep shift. that if you end up doing PhD postdoc yeah. whatever please keep that in mind <laughs> it's very very quick and yeah. very easy to just get caught in this vicious cycle of if I spend a couple more hours, mm. this experiment's gonna work, so then I'm gonna have a lot more data, so then tomorrow when I come in, I've got lots to analyze, and then I can start another one, mm. and then if I stay just, you know, one or two hours yeah. more, I'll get something. You find it's 11.30 at night, and you're a bit like, yeah, yeah. this is maybe not <laughs> healthy. So that's what I was like during my PhD. Yeah. I mean, when I look back on it, holiday was not a thing. Mm. Um, having started my postdoc, it's a lot more intense um, and I never thought that was possible after what I did <laughs> during my PhD but it is. Uh -huh. It's just that I'm more conscious of the fact yeah. that if I don't look after myself mm. the work is not going to get done. So yes. it's, it's yes. very difficult. I still struggle with mm. work-life balance but I've tried to find a way of at least, so for example even just half an hour of a bit of exercise yeah. in the evenings just to switch off yes because I'm not very good at switching off uh, so I need to have something where I just I can't physically be there mm -hmm. and think about it so I have tried to incorporate that into my routine mm -hmm. 
slightly, 2020 is a bit on shaky ground <laughs> to begin with, but hopefully we'll get back onto it. Uh, and it really helps, I think, if you've got people who are around you who mm. also <clears throat> need that. And so you kind of group together and yeah. you know that you have those people to fall yeah. back on to be like, okay, now is the time we need to go yeah. and do that half an hour and then we can always come back and exactly. carry on. So that's made a huge difference. And I would l really, really want to stress that the things that really get you through all the kind of hard and dark times of mm. any part of research are the people that you surround yourself with. Yes. And I have to say, irrespective of how competitive the environment can be, mm. there are a lot of genuine people in science who will be there mm -hmm. and who, because have been through the same thing, can really relate to you. And to have that cohort of people around makes a huge difference. It really does. So I would say that's actually one of the biggest things, is yeah. to find the people who can be there and have gone through it with you. Mm. And that's why I would say if you do end up doing a PhD, those years that you spend with those people, you will have them around for life. Mm. I mean, 10 years on, you know, I'm sure that's what it's going to be like. Yeah. So that makes a huge difference. I don't know if I've completely un un answered the work-life balance <laughs> question. That's because I'm avoiding it because I'm so bad at it. But yeah, it's good to have a yes. work-life balance. And I think that's what I want to just yeah, stress. You really want to important. establish that. Like, yeah. It's really, really important. Yeah, it, it's, it makes a huge yeah. difference. Well, I should come and check on you. <laughs> so I'm like, have you got that? <laughs> The yeah, good luck with good luck with that one. It's a it's a working progress. It's a okay. hypothesis that's still working and going. But yeah, we'll see. Okay. Um. So I think just to kind of bring it to a close. Yep. What would be your top three tips on like getting into science, staying in it? Trying to progress. Okay, so let's do three <laughs> each of them. <laughs> okay, oh god, I just, what the hell did I you sign did, myself up for? You just walked into that. <laughs> um, okay, so getting into science, I would say career like networks yeah. and sessions are very important. Um, trying to speak to people who mm -hmm. are already there. And I don't know how often there's these types of events, but when I was at school, we had a lot of kind of take your daughter to work day oh, okay, or like, yeah. you know, visit an institution or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a way of getting some sort of experience, just yeah. so that if you have no idea, it, yeah. it might give you a taster of whether it's something that would interest you. Yeah. Actually, oh. building on from that, just to let you guys know, I know if I'm correct, the mm -hmm. Institute does offer work experience for okay, yep. um, those who are in year 10. Yeah, because I know that with the UK yeah, education some, system, yeah. um, when you're in year 10, you kind of have a few days to yeah. go into a work setting yeah. to get a bit of a ex get experience in that field. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that our Institute offers that. So that is one way that you can yeah, get yourself exposed to science and see the yeah, nitty-gritty, yeah. the day-to-day, -day, yeah. the wet lab stuff, the dry lab stuff, you yeah, know, yeah, I mean, it and just see well. which which aspect interests you and that would help to oh, shape definitely. your decisions yeah. later on. Yeah. Um, in terms of staying in science, mm -hmm. whew, uh, you have to be very driven. Yeah. Um, you have to accept failure. Mm-hmm. And you have to be very, very resilient. Mm. I'd say those are probably the three things that stick with yeah. me. Uh, and in terms of progression, now, that's something <laughs> I need to ask someone higher up as to what the options are. So the way, I mean, where I'm at right now, I'm uh, two years into my first postdoc. Uh, the fact that I've kind of gone with half industry, half academia, is slightly different and maybe not the norm, but mm -hmm. I think is becoming more and more popular yes. as an option. And I would recommend it. I mean, I'm based morely on the academic side, um, but I mean, I've seen what it's like to be mm -hmm. in industry. And I think it's something that if they are doing more of these types of things is worth considering. Yeah. And in terms of where I see myself, um, I would quite like to stay in research for mm -hmm. sure. I think that's where I'm happiest at. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't doing research. <laughs> that's also the other problem. Um, Which I think kind of brings me to a slight 
I won't say issue, but yeah. I think because research, I mean, the, the view that I had as a student is that it's research or industry. And I feel like there was an underlying turn of like, industry is where you sell your soul. <laughs> that, I felt that a bit. So I think people then have this thing of academia or, or industry. So I think that's still there. Okay. Um, whereas I would have said I had the opposite interpretation. Really? It was more industry, you kind of go there to, you know, make the money mm-hmm. and have a good work-life balance and everything is dandy if yeah. you go down the industry route. Whereas if you go down the academic route, it's hard graft, full mm. stop. Um and I hear different things. I mean, I'm not enough on the industry side to comment, mm-hmm. but I know that I think both sides is as hard yeah. as each of them. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one, but I think we still are in that frame of mind and we still pass that on, that the two options are academia, industry. And I think that needs to yeah. not necessarily change steps. completely, it's just, there should be a third branch. Exactly. There, there are other options out there, and it's not, you know, frowned upon if you don't mm-hmm. want to be a PI. It's not frowned upon if you don't want to go into pharma and you know, make the big bucks, so mm. to speak. Uh, it's okay to you know go into finance if you want mm-hmm. or civil service or anything. It's just I think whatever you end up choosing, if you've gone from a science background, just it's something that does not close yeah. any doors. Yeah. And I think that is very very important. Is doing anything science related irrespective of whether it's just you know an undergraduate undergraduate degree a master's degree phd mm. you are not closing any doors yeah. if anything i think you're opening up a lot of other avenue, avenues because yes. of the skills that you gain through that the character building that yeah you, they that you, you can transfer them yeah, yeah, yeah it really definitely is, it really is transferable yeah. what would you say is the clear if there is a clear difference between a PhD and a postdoc, because you're now two years into your postdoc, is there something that you could just pinpoint of like, okay, this this is different, or is it more or less... For me, the the biggest difference is the time aspect. Mm -hmm. So during my PhD, I knew that I had, you know, four years to achieve X. With postdocs, the postdoc positions that you get are normally a lot shorter. So very rarely you'll get a three-year position from the offset. Hmm. but normally they're around a two-year position. So you really have to crank up what you do. And I think you have to be very kind of aware that you need to have several projects going on at Hmm. the same time. So it's a a question of juggling, I think, a lot more uh, in postdoc compared to PhD. And is there an increase? I mean, the more more you have a shorter time frame, and is there more of a pressure? to publish yes. and get your, your name out you de- there. You definitely you have, a, have that more, yeah. um, especially if you then want to be applying for fellowships, which mm. fortunately, unfortunately, fellowship applications are very much based on you yeah. know, output, which in this situation, output is, is publications. publications. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting, because I just, I mean, I've always wondered that of like, it's yeah, not doing science. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but the it's pressures kind of, do the change. Yeah. Increases which a which kind of makes sense if it's a case of you're working up the ladder, yeah. so to speak. So yeah, there's there's more expected of you. Hmm. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah. Random <laughs> question. But what would you say is your life mantra or? Okay. So what I go by, which yeah. some people may or may not like, mm-hmm. is a. Uh, it's not what you deserve in life, but it's what you can negotiate. Oh, yeah. I like that. Mm-hmm. Nice. So that's what I go by. Guys, <laughs> do you hear that? It's not what you deserve, but it's what you negotiate. I think that's actually very good because it really shows how active you have to be in yeah. you know, your life choices. Don't Definitely. just live life passively. Yeah. And like, Ooh. But yeah, okay. Thank you very much that's for your right. insight. Um, it's been lovely having you and Thanks chatting Thanks very much for you. having me. Um, so guys, I really hope you've enjoyed uh, this conversation that we've had together. And don't forget to like, subscribe, comment and share. And I will see you in the next one. Bye! Bye. <laughs> that was so great! <laughs>